What am I gonna do with you? Twenty-one years since their debut album, Slipknot are as bold, fearless, uncompromising, and visceral as ever. It's not my fault that a lot of simple minds can't understand us. With over 30 million sales, countless streams, and awards to their name, and a legion of devoted fans, they remain one of the biggest bands of any genre on the planet. We walk out on stage and it's just rammed. <laughs> we still look at each other and go, what is it? Happening. But it's not been an easy journey, with turbulence and tragedy following in their wake. Death isn't going to stop Slipknot. Original members not being around isn't going to stop Slipknot. Their phenomenal success dictates that you will normally only see them perform on arena or festival stages in front of tens of thousands of people. But today's different. Today, the iconic nine piece are here at the historic Maida Vale Studios with no stage, playing in front of just a few dedicated fans for BBC Radio 1. Trust me, you will never have seen them like this before. Slipknot Live is interesting. It's all adrenaline, frenetic thoughts, trying to kind of keep a lid on it, trying to hold yourself back because you want to perform well. But at the same time, you are just absolutely gagging to get this show going. And it's like this collision of nervous energy and anticipation from the second it starts. There's got to be an easier way. Look, haven't aged a day. Can't even tell. You are willing to do whatever it takes to make this the best show that anybody's ever seen. Slipknot Live is like nothing else. Nine guys on stage playing aggressive music. There's not one single moment on that stage that's wasted for them. And I think there's very few bands that 20 years in their career still have that intensity. A total explosion of your senses. They literally just grab you by the throat, shake you around, throw you to the floor, stamp on you a little bit, pick you back up, headbutt you, and that's what a Slipknot gig is like. It's never slowed down. They've just been one of those bands that have been incredibly impactful on anybody who's come in contact with them. When you see 70,000 people jumping to this thing that came out of your head, that's one of the greatest feelings ever. There's an adrenaline rush to that, aside from just playing on stage, that, you know, you become a junkie for it. We compare it to jumping out of an airplane with or without a parachute, and you don't know if it's going to open or not. You know, this band is a, a arena, stadium headliner, festival headlining act, and to have them play in a room of such a small capacity, you know that that is just going to be like some hurricane coming in here and lifting the roof off. And those lucky people that are in seeing the show are going to see something really special. To be able to get up in London and be able to come to the BBC and become part of history, it's a big deal for us, just an honor.
I was actually at the first Slipknot show, 95, at what was called the Safari Club. We heard the rumblings that Slipknot was gonna play and they ended up playing that night. They walked through the audience. They came through us. They didn't come from the backstage. They walked through us and were like pushing us out of the way. All I can tell you, it, it was the most cacophonous noise I'd ever enjoyed in my life. It was theatrical, it was engaging, it was antagonistic. The fuel for everything that we would eventually kind of jump into headlong was right there. And I remember saying to myself, I'm going to be the singer in this band. A year and a half later, I was. Having worked with the band for over 20 years, it's the same band better performers and they're better players because they've been doing it so long, they've honed their craft, but it's that same intensity that they have in their heart that they just can't wait to give out to everybody else. To be honest with you, I don't think I could describe a live show. I mean, we're obviously very active on stage. It's like a 90, 95 minute cardio workout. It's kind of a blur, you know, for me. I was with Slipknot in 1998 when they got signed to Roadrunner Records. It was Ozfest in Camden, New Jersey. And I was in the audience waiting for the band to go on. It's before the record was out, before people really knew who Slipknot was. There were thousands of people running over the hill to get to the second stage. There was blood, there was violence. They were just so captured in the moment that they just can't control themselves. There's all these extreme moments. The injuries have stacked up to a point where it's like, be careful. It's the things that are starting to happen because of the longevity of the band. 
it used to be these sort of things like bones and things like that. Now it's the responsibility of making the decisions I made. I have the worst tendonitis and carpal tunnel from hitting a keg with a pipe. It's called shock. When you use metal on metal, and the point of this, the vibration has to go somewhere. So it goes at the bottom of the keg and it goes up my arm. A normal person would just quit using the pipe, but I can't get the sound out any other way. It's part of the recipe. There's no sense stopping now. So I gotta walk out on stage and literally be like, dude, you're, you're, you're going way too fast. You need to bring it down. The vomiting and all those stories, I mean, this thing has been a learning thing for us from the beginning. The reason the vomiting was happening is because, you know, we're playing Ozfest. It's 99 degrees out. We're wearing masks and coveralls. We're making $20 a day per diem, no salary. We're not getting paid to be there, you know. We all quit our jobs. We're all stuck on this bus. So you eat when you get a chance and then you pack your belly full of food and you're on stage doing all this and it's like, oh God, I ate too much. You know, we had to learn, okay, dumbass, don't eat, you know, four hours before you play, try to get some energy, some food in, like, you know, like. Well, these days it takes a lot longer to get ready for a show like that, man. There's a lot of stretching, there's a lot of Advil. <laughs> you know, it's not just about just throwing everything around and hoping that it sticks. We know the mindset's gonna be there. It's just about coaxing the physicality back into it and just making sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. It's, it's one of the reasons why the, the, the huddle, since day one, is so important. We always make sure that there's a point where we all come together and become a band. And we stop being nine people and we become a band. And that is, to me, what sets the tone. And as soon as we step on that stage, that's not nine dudes out there just peacocking. It is a band that is ready to tear your fucking head off.
God, what can I say that hasn't already been said, to be honest? The masks have changed definition-wise for me over the years. When I first joined the band, it was an amazing way to kind of tap into that antagonism. Dare I say it, that theatricality. We were still trying to kind of figure out what we were, you know? And as we wrote, as we really started to kind of fill in the blanks as far as like the music goes. The masks took on a whole different meaning for us. The mask now is a representation of the person I used to be. We all change, we all evolve. I'm not the same pissed off jackass that I was 20 years ago, but I remember him. I remember why he was like that. So when you have that type of relationship with the person that you were, putting on that mask represents putting on that face and putting on that head, and putting on that thought process. Having to tap into things that maybe you would like to forget, but you know that by doing that, you're helping other people. You're letting them let stuff go, whether it's their first show or their 20th. You're allowing them to release that energy instead of maybe, God forbid, hurting themselves. They're screaming into the ether and letting that go. It's a way to unlock my pain. It's a way for them to let their pain go. In a lot of ways, it's a way for us to strengthen our resolve in trying to move past it. It's the people who get stuck in that that can't move on. When you start spinning your wheels in a moment of pain, that's all you're gonna feel. But if you can get the traction to get past it, you can explore and, and find yourself in a different life, you know? And that's what I was able to do with Slipknot and wearing the mask. The masks in the beginning was like, it was sort of an anti-image statement. It's like, not, it's not about who we are, it's about what the music is. It's something very clever that they did early, early on, and I'm glad that they've kept it and they've not been tempted to take them off. The second I put that mask on, it hurts. There's a whole ritual that goes about it because you're putting on the uniform. You're putting on the makeup for underneath. You're putting on the mask to go on top of it. It's a great way to get into the mentality of Slipknot, that war zone in your head. And I can tell when I've put it on too tight because then my brain is just throbbing the entire show. Those are usually the really good ones. I'm not like one of the most secure people you'll ever meet. So I feel like with a mask on, I can like be that pretend rock star that, you know, that I always dreamt about. And without it, I'm a little bit more like kind of like reserved and drawn in a little bit and I kind of hide behind the monitors, you know. But with the mask, it's just like, here I am, full roar, you know, uninhibiting, you know. It's surreal. I really feel like I accomplished something. You know, that's what it does to you. It puts you in a place for 90 minutes. And when you're done, I'm like, God, even if I had a bad show, I had to have had a good show. The overall image of Slipknot is always going to be about those masks and the music that's behind it. It's part of what they are. You don't even know if it's me, man. That's, that's the deal. I could be a paid actor. I look alike. I'm a lot thinner than the other clown, I'll tell you that much. Slipknot's a very odd thing. He's already three new guys. This is the greatest band ever. 
It's Walt Disney. It's the Muppets. It's whatever you want it to be. I don't know if you noticed, but we are actually going to give you a song each from each album that we have put out. So right now, we would like to give you a song off of Point Five, The Great Chapter. Would you like to hear a song off that album, my friends? Yeah, I'm back. 
looked around, the metal scene was just a bunch of pretty people with spiky hair and shiny clothes, and we were like, what is this? Our whole mentality was, okay, you want cheekbones, you want pretty people, here's a mask. You want the latest fashion, here's my coveralls. You want my name? Screw you, here's my number. Here's my barcode for what music was at the time was a commodity. It was us basically telling the entire world, screw you. We're bringing it back to what it was and what it should have been. We've always really tried to go visually for something different, something like an evolution. There's a very unique marriage of thought and art that really makes it stand apart from everything. There are always going to be people who misunderstand us. There's always going to be people, and to this day, people think we're satanic. <laughs> I'm like, are you nuts? We speak our minds, and people are offended by that. Humanity has embraced controversy. Well, maybe it's just created because we need something to, to give us meaning. You know what I mean? Need something to argue about. It's ridiculous. Like, if they knew us, they'd realize that we're actually worse than they think. We're smarter than they think. There's a lot of art behind what we do. We're just smart, man. We all have a mindset. That's how we've lasted. You're with Slipknot or you're without, but you're not gonna stop Slipknot. Death isn't gonna stop Slipknot. Original members not being around isn't gonna stop Slipknot. In a world that isn't perfect, we're, we're just trying to create an organism that feels right for us, that I can ride out until I'm dead because we work really hard to be where we're at, and it's pure art, and it's pure love from the people around. We've just pretty much been killing ourselves for this. We expect it. It's not my fault that a lot of simple minds can't understand us. That's right! Let me see you fucking jump and go! Who are the maggots and why are they called? I mean, at this point, it's anybody, you know? I mean, you used to be able to recognize them a lot easier. It's anybody who is looking for a voice and maybe feels like they don't have it. It's anybody who just really digs the music and needs that release. You know, I've had, you know, kids who've come up in the standard J11, you know, wardrobe for a metal fan, and then I've had dudes come straight from work suit and tie. Yeah, as soon as the music starts, they're taking their tie off and their jacket and they're like, you know, they're letting loose. And to, the, to me, that's the appeal. You have to be really into music to enjoy what we do. You have to listen to music in a very specific way to enjoy what we do. And I'm proud of that. Playing these big festivals and looking out into the crowd, it just, it just looks like this. You know what I mean, out there, and that's kind of what maggots on a decaying corpse, roadkill or whatever looks like. If you want to trip out on all the weird things in life, you know, there's even a, an organism that will eat dead things. You'll get rid of it, just whoosh. So the maggots, I've always believed, are ourselves. Maggots evolve, they turn into flies. I think ours turn into butterflies, though. I try to design a band around the 50% of people that want to be around us, the 50% of the people that love what we do. 
that understands, cares, has empathy for the human condition, needs heavy, aggressive music for temperature and emotion, people who are questioning their social and cultural awareness. It's people that are 60, it's people that are 10. It's every genre, every ethnicity, every income level, it's everybody, because everybody can relate to pain. Everybody can relate to anguish. Everybody can relate to not fitting in. That's where Slipknot fills that void. It's a boiling point that if it's not reckoned with, it can scar and it can make a big difference in your life. It's healing, it's medicine. If you read Corey Taylor's lyrics and listen to him, you'll see it. He's not afraid to release that pain. And if you hear the music, the music goes along with it. Every ounce of pain that Clown has, or Corey has, or Jim has, or Mick has, all comes out in that. And that's what the fans respond to. I push my fingers into my... Time has not spared us the hardships, obviously. 
it was unavoidable. As, as mad as this band is, the addictions, the alcoholism, you were just hell-bent out of control the way we were. It was going to end somewhere. I don't want to say that it was the cliched, you know, troubled history of a band like us, but sometimes the insanity happens and you live through it or you mourn the ones who don't. When we lost Paul, it was a, a wake-up call in a lot of different ways, and we've gotten through it together. We say to ourselves all the time, you can't write this. If I go back on all my tragedies and all my pluses, it's really, you can't write any of it. I wouldn't say that, that these things have, have informed pain in, in the writing. It's informed catharsis. It's helped us move on. Obviously, coming from the Midwest, we were raised by a generation that stuffed feelings down and we didn't deal with things. As time's gone on, we've realized that's a, a great way to, you know, to kind of lose your mind. I think my focus came as my children were being born, you know? It became important for me to really get it together. Once I had that focus, that anchor to my life, that was all that mattered, you know? I've been able to enjoy this band from day one because of Corey Taylor's lyrics, so I, I take him very serious. And the trust that he has to us and the organization to record, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to pull in all that emotion and give it. So I take it very seriously. Corey's like amazing at metaphoric lyricism and, you know, melody and, and and anybody can take anything. Even if he's talking about something that's specific to his life, he can do it so metaphorically that anybody can relate to it. And that's, that's a special gift, that's a talent. Our recording process, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, it's very euphoric. It's very sad, it's very emotional. You know, I find myself crying a lot, and especially when you start something from the beginning. It could just be one piano note. Ding, and you just, that emotion, that color, Emotion's hard for me to share, and that's one thing I love about this band. They're able to break that wall in me to where I'm forced to share my emotion. But it's behind closed doors, and it's for very few eyes. God, I need it. We need it, and um, I love to relive it. Like I said, it's never been about videos or interviews or re recordings or albums. It's always been about the show. The hardships the band has, have been through have, have made us stronger relationships sacrificed and, you know, band members passing away and pushes you to make sure that it was worth it, to make sure that you keep moving forward, to make sure that you're doing it. The pain never goes away. It just becomes manageable, you know? We've had to kind of really find ways to stay sane in a mad world, you know? Writing has definitely helped, making music, has helped, but the gratifying thing is seeing that it helps other people, you know? Because we're all going through it. We all lose, we all hurt, and we all try to maintain. All we can do is try to find ways to get through it. By making this music, it helps us move on. And hopefully, by listening to this music, it helps other people move on. We lost Paul quite a few years ago, and, and if he were here today, he would be like, yes! We're doing it still, you know what I mean? He'd be stoked. That's also a motivating force, you know? What's kept Subnot going over the years, despite all the tragedy, I think is their love for each other and their love for the fans. The untimely, unfortunate passing of Paul Gray, who was the life pulse of that band. Paul Gray was the center. He was the guy that kept everyone together. He was just that warm soul that you wanted to be around and be close to. So whether it was Paul Gray passing away, whether it was Joey Jordison not being in the band, different tragedies that have happened, the sum of Slipknot's always been more important. That brotherhood between them and that connection with the fans is unusual. Our relationship's pretty complex, you know? There's definitely a, a lot of layers to it. I was an only child, so I don't know what it's like to have siblings. Now, after 20 years, I can honestly say I know what it would feel like to have uh, you know, brothers. 
probably argue and fight, but I, I would do anything for any one of them, and I know that they would do the same for me. And it's, it's like family, you know? Like, you might not necessarily get along with that person today, but you'd kill for them, you know? Or if anybody ever did anything to them, it would you'd take it personally. And that's how I feel about these guys, you know? And sometimes they do things that piss me off, but it's like, well, you gotta do you, and that's what you're doing, so I, how can I argue with that? In the beginning, it was all this, like, really heavy, aggressive, you know, we're beating each other up on stage, you know? And I think that if you really dig down into Corey's lyrics and you look at, and I, for me personally, if I look at the people that I, you know, I get messages on social media or whatever it is who we've helped, you'll see that there's a lot of light and brightness there. There's a lot of hope there. And I think people tend to overlook that. That's one of the other things that people overlook. You know, they just think, oh, metal band, doom, gloom, depression, you know, and all that. But uh, I, I think uh, you need to, to get through that in order to find the light at the end of the tunnel. And there's, you know, Corey, there's a lot of hope in his lyrics. We don't touch religion because it's too confusing. And you have to respect people who have faith, no matter what it is. If they want to have faith in a tree, so be it. Who, who am I to say? So we don't touch it or mass amounts of politicalness. I just don't want to get caught in lies and, you know, I don't want to be passionate about truth and then have liars burn it down and confuse the drama. Like, it's not worth it for me. I'm here to let you know, don't judge me. I'll do what the hell I want. I don't care who you are. You shouldn't care who I am. I shouldn't care who you are. This is your life. These are your days. This is your breath. This is your blood. Get what you can get out of it. Allow me to get what I can out of it. Don't judge me. We don't have anything to prove to anyone but ourselves, and as long as I'm making myself happy and I'm not lying to myself, then usually the maggots are like, you know, I'm still in because I might not agree with that decision, but at least they believe it, and that's truth. So just don't, I think it, the message is don't ever judge me. You wanna know how this exists? It exists because we don't allow people to judge us. We kick the door in. You wanna judge, we kick the door in. And then you got a deal. And then you realize judging is not the way. So that's what Slipknot stands for. Always, always, always. <laughs> Fuck you. Let me see your hands. 
Subnaut Sound is, to me, the most unique thing about the band. You have nine guys playing rock music, but they have a sampler, they have a DJ. Things like the keyboards and Craig the Sampler, they add so many elements that their peers don't have. The kegs and the percussion and everything adds like almost like this jackhammer action, almost like a, a churning that just kind of sits in the background, you know? It's become this pulsing, aggravated heartbeat that kind of runs through the middle of all the riffs and all the crazy stuff that I'm saying and kind of keeps all the elements together. We were able to really kind of capture that and, and, and take it as far as we could. It'll start with one of us usually with an arrangement, and then it'll just evolve from there until everybody can get to the point where it makes sense. Sometimes Jay and I will do jams in studios, clown drum cadences where you can get like guitar ideas and more rhythmic sounding stuff to layer. Sid or maybe even Craig, they add something to it. It's just like, whoa, that just took it to a whole nother level. Like a stitch, yeah. They kind of came out around the same time as new metal and kind of got badged in there, but they were so far away from that. I mean, Slipknot sound is thunderous cacophony of noise that when it hits you, it's like something that you've never had before. They created a fan base that spreads way beyond any genre of music any style of music, any one record, any one song. It's about a lifestyle and it's about a culture. It's as crazy to me as a manager to see the magnitude of that all around the world. Whether I go to Japan or Mexico City or Lima, Peru or Taiwan, that culture's there. In a lot of ways, we're bigger than we've ever been. It's got us in this weird state of like, what is happening? You know, especially in the state of the way music is now. Nobody really sounds like us, especially nobody massive. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or the fact that we've gotten better or what, but our fan base has cemented itself and grown. 
we walk out on stage and it's just rammed. I mean, it is absolutely jammed packed full of people. We still look at each other and go, what is happening, you know? So yeah, I mean, we're completely blown away by it. The appeal of our band, I, I couldn't begin to tell you. The combination of the players, if it's dumb luck, if it's the amount of work we put in over the past 20 years, you know, it's important to evolve and not repeat yourself. Keep the evolution going. Slipknot's appeal is now a mass appeal. What started off as a really small, aggressive musical style that I think a lot of people didn't understand is now something that's globally understood by people that aren't metal fans. Peel just spreads because it's more than the music. It is a lifestyle. I know it's been a minute, but are you happy to have Slipknot back in your fucking beautiful city, goddamn? They've always had ambition. And when I first met with Clown, he was like, I'm gonna be the biggest band in the world with the least amount of compromise. I'm gonna build a drum kit that goes 15 feet in the air and flips upside down. To me, that was crazy at that time, but an hour into the meeting with him, talking like that, in my mind, I was like, they're gonna do it. They're gonna be that band that is heavy and aggressive and uncompromising, but appeal to everybody. A lot of that was Clown's vision or the band's vision from early on. They always knew what they wanted to do. And quickly after that, they're on the cover of NME. They played on K-Rock Radio, which is the big alternative radio station in Los Angeles. So that appeal just went immediately from being underground, aggressive culture that no one understood to being this mass culture that all of a sudden is accepted by all these other groups of people. We were looked down upon from day one because we were a metal band. Like, not only a metal band, but, I mean, do the math, dude. Metal band with nine members and masks uh, and coveralls who didn't tell people our names. All we did was just go out and shred. We were faster than every band that was really out at the time. We smelled horrible. There was no real appealing element to us, and yet we captured the imagination of an entire generation. The disdain came very quickly, you know, not only from our peers, who have then kind of come around, but from the industry in general. In the wake of 9-11, we really kind of had all the rugs yanked out from under us. We kind of had to, almost had to just kind of start over because everyone became super sensitive and we were kind of like the poster children for what was wrong with the country and whatnot. And yet we were still where we were. The rallying cry is that we've had no respect. Every year we put out an album, there is a piece somewhere in the pop world which goes, well, this band Slipknot's gonna be putting out an album, but next week there's going to be, and of course there's the inevitable, we go number one, and they're like, well, that was a fluke. And I was like, oh, you wanna tell the other two albums before that that it was a fluke, you jackass? We will probably never get the kind of recognition that a lot of, I'll say it, lesser bands get. Um, and we're okay with that. Slipknot has nothing to prove to anybody but ourselves. And because of that, I think, you know, our lovely culture really trusts us. We haven't changed. I mean, yeah, our shells have changed. We have changed. Our philosophies haven't changed. Our music hasn't changed. I mean, we're really blessed in this life to be able to have stumbled across music. I'm gonna go 
Playing by the rules is something that, you know, we've always gone against. And it's weird because, you know, as society kind of evolves, the rules change. We've never played by the rules, man. That was evident from the second we put out Iowa. Everybody was expecting this, this soft, fluffy, sophomore effort, you know? It's like, this is where we capitalize on all the success from the first album, and we just went, and just said, we're not gonna play by your rules. You're either with us or against us. We're gonna do things our way, making decisions based on our heart, not based on this. Some of my favorite bands were, you know, bands like the Beatles, and, and, and I used to, you know, be absolutely obsessed by it. And I remember in an interview, it was Sir Paul McCartney said at the end of it, at the end of the day, their message was love. You know, and that's heavy. That's a, a heavy thing and, and it made me think well what is ours <laughs> you know what i mean like what are we trying to say i don't like holding people over the coals anymore for lessons i figure everybody's big boys and girls now and i've tried to help people with what i thought is true i've had to evolve i've had to learn but that doesn't change the fact i'm still going to be an asshole i'm still going to do what i want this is all meant to be now it's very fun we broke the rules and they got rid of them you know that's good for some odd. That's good. People 